And so everything is recorded and it will be posted uh, within 48 hours on our archives page. Please, everybody, if something inspires you today, if it has triggered some thoughts and conversations that you would like to have, please share out this link in this recording with your peers and people in the community, um, because this is an important conversation that we are about to have today. Our code of conduct, I'm going to give you guys about a minute to go ahead and read the code of conduct, and it is also located on our webpage. So very exciting. If you are a member of TLA or if you're not even a member and you want to join and come to conference, early bird registration is open. So you can get that early bird rate until January 31st. Our conference this year is in San Antonio. It is April 16th through 19th. A lot of exciting things happening this year. So to get the most up-to-date news, please check out our webpage and our social media as well. So when we have things like our general session speakers or things like that, you want to be the first one to know. So make sure you follow us on our social media pages as well. Renew your, renewal for membership is open, so you must be a 2024 member in order to qualify for that 2024 member annual conference price. And so keep that in mind when you're registering, that membership needs to be renewed in order to get that wonderful price for conference. And so our session today with Cindy is a beautiful preview of a couple of conversations that TLA, along with TSLAC, is having throughout our state of Texas. So we will be in three areas in the fall, and we're going to be in the El Paso and Wichita Falls area in the early winter. So this weekend on the 21st, we will be in Lubbock. On the 28th will be in Clute, it's just outside of Houston. And on November 10th, we will be in Victoria. So it is a series of conversations about narrowing that digital divide in Texas. And these areas have been identified as areas of need in the digital realm. And so if you're interested in coming, it is completely free scan that QR code and pre-register so we know how many people are coming. Um, but especially today, if you're inspired by this conversation and want to go a little bit deeper and see a panelist of people discussing this topic, um, definitely come check out those digital conversations. We do have our self-paced learning that is up on Vimeo. Just scan the QR code. There's different categories. So especially as we have the holidays coming up and you might have a little bit of downtime, but you still want to get your CE from the comfort of your home, uh, check out our self-paced learning. And we do, for our school librarians, we do have our school administrators conference. It is digital. It is for purchase for Vimeo. If you want to gift your administrator a lovely gift of learning more about librarians and libraries and how to make the most successful library on campus, uh, share the love and scan that QR code and get them going to that school administrators conference. And the reason why every single person is here today is to see Cindy Fisher. Cindy is going to be talking about connecting all Texans to the internet and the importance of working with the libraries. Um, Cindy, we just updated her title. So she is the Digital Opportunity Program Supervisor at the Texas Broadband Development Office. And Cindy, it is yours to take over. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Kelly. It's lovely to be here. I see so many familiar faces um, and it's nice to be back with my, my library pals. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen and I'll, um, then we can get hop right into the presentation. Oh, there we go. 
All right, share. Okay, how does that look for everybody? Can y'all see my screen? Great. Yes. Okay. So welcome. Um, again, it's my absolute pleasure to be able to present and talk with you all today. Uh, my my the community in which you all are representing is one that I is near and dear to my heart as a as a librarian. Um, many of you I've known from the past, so it's I am so excited to be able to be here and talk about something that I know that libraries have been doing for so long, digital literacy, and the ways in which you already know how to connect with your communities around digital opportunity. So uh, the text, so we're, what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about kind of a big picture approach to what the next couple of at least the next year is going to look like in terms of this massive federal funding that's going to ma be made available to um, to libraries and library organizations as well as to communities across Texas and a little bit more about give you some of the, the internal nitty-gritty on how to prepare for some of this funding and then how to how to work with um, the Texas Broadband Development Office, which is where I am now located. So, okay. So I want to level set before we jump in and just make sure that when we talk about broadband, because it is literally the thing that everyone is talking about these days when we talk about connectivity and digital divide, is the sort of benchmarks. And some of you already may be very familiar with some of these, but it's just important that we're all on the same page here. So the Federal Communications Commission, which sets the definition for broadband, sets it as a minimum for 25 megabits up for download speeds and three megabits up for, download, for upload speeds. As we think about what is actually possible when folks are connecting to the internet, when you have multiple people in a home trying to connect to the same router, the same internet service, we all, we know in particular that this is just not enough capacity. As, as I'm sure you've heard in other presentations and in conversation with community members is that sharing this, um, these, this speed is just not enough. You have too, too many devices connected. So when we're thinking about how to, how to measure increased capacity as we look to the future for connecting all Texans is we're actually trying to look at larger and better connectivity speeds. So when we're talking about how to sort of measure connectivity, we're looking at 100 megabits download speed and 20 megabits upload speed. So the upload is sort of what we're doing right now. Like I'm talking to you and I'm also, um, you're seeing my video and download speeds is, you know, any information that you're downloading back to your computer. We often talk about high-speed internet broadbands. It's quite frankly, the same thing. It's pretty interchangeable, but there are two different ways that you can actually get broadband delivered to you. We have the physical way of delivering broadband and connectivity, which is that wired broadband. And then you have the wireless broadband. So when you're talking about Wi-Fi, um, other ways of getting that, getting that internet. Um, and that, the reason why I want to talk a little bit about the infrastructure piece is that oftentimes this is invisible to people. So when you are trying to help someone connect to an internet connection, when you're trying to discuss, you know, if you're asking them, maybe helping them connect to or sign up for a service provider, often people do not really know what they have in their home, right? If they have it in their home, maybe they say, oh, I have internet because they're able to connect via a cell phone. And often they're not using a, a broadband internet for that cell phone, they're on cell service, right? They're used, they're connecting through other, other means. So the, again, just like kind of a broad introduction. So we've got fiber objects, coaxial cable, satellite, which is where many of our rural, um, our, our rural uh, Texans are needing to access satellite in order to get reliable broadband. And then microwave, which honestly, I'm like, now, I'm just, now that it's up there, I'm like, microwave? How many people are going to be a microwave? But again, a multitude of options that we, when we talk about broadband is really important to understand. The infrastructure piece, and I just want to caveat that too by saying so often what we are hearing, um, the big, a lot of people understand infrastructure. So they understand that they have to be able, it has to be a physical tower to connect to in order to get connectivity. What you and I know, right, as library staff, where we're coming from is that often you have the connection, but you need the other pieces. And so we're going to talk about that as well. 
So again, we sort of know this, like 25 megabits up, three, three, three megabits down. That's the current speed we're trying to get. We really want to see an increase in that because we know that people are relying on the internet access for so many more things. Some of the benefits of access, we see it every day. Telework, accessibility, public safety, these are all kind of the, the same things that underline, underlie ways in which, as a, as a society, we're able to interact with one another. Um, it's often a, uh, you know, anything that, anything that you need for your life is, and if you don't have internet access, often made worse by not having internet access, right? So if you're already struggling, and on top of that, you don't have internet access, it makes it even more difficult to participate. Just some quick thoughts here. Um, there are approximately 3 million Texas households, and this is households, so this isn't even talking about the number of people, but households that do not have access to broadband. And those top three issues are the lack of infrastructure, the inability to use a device or understand why uh, I have the skills to be able to use that device well, and then even have a device or have um, the funds in, in order to purchase or have that device. So I wanna also talk a little bit about, cause this is gonna come up a little bit later in the conversation is when we talk about people that are most negatively impacted by the digital divide, you could talk about a lot of different ways. Um, you can talk about um, people on the wrong side of the digital divide. You could talk about people that have historically been impacted by the digital divide. But Feder, when we're talking about how to kind of group categories of people, the way that the federal government in dispensing a lot of these programs has decided to so sort of term them is these idea of covered populations. And we're thinking about it, I like to think that it's it's a nice way of, of, of um, describing it in that covered means that we're covering them, we're helping them to be blanketed by this new funding to bring them in. So when we think about um, who is negatively impacted by the digital divide and the folks that we really wanna consider to um, in any additional programming around resources, when I think about these uh, covered populations. So folks from low, info, low income households, those that are in, from aging populations who are seniors, those that are incarcerated, and of course, those that have, that have been impacted by the, uh, the justice system, justice involved individuals, veterans, people with disabilities. And that, again, we know that disability runs the gamut. So you might have a physical disability, cognitive disability that can run the gamut, but again, negatively impacted. Folks with um, language barriers, so maybe English language learners, or they're more fluent in a secondary language or a primary language, and English is, is more um, something that they're developing. Racial and ethnic minorities, as well as folks in rural areas. So again, when we're thinking about those people that have been negatively impacted over a period of time by lack of access to either infrastructure or resources, when we think about um, designing programs and who we should be focusing on, it's folks that fall into these areas. So the other thing that I also want to call out is the way that we talk about a sort of suite of skills or categories or services that, um, that kind of encompass a larger wraparound of um, the ability for folks to be able to make use of that infrastructure. So we think about this in, uh, the, at the state broadband office, we talk about this in terms of digital opportunity. So ways in which you can leverage uh, infrastructure to increase opportunity. And again, these probably won't be that unfamiliar to this group, which is digital literacy, um, being able to uh, navigate the skills and the, the devices in order to make best use of those um, the online opportunities, affordable service, so being able to afford the internet, quality technical support, that is um, being able to have ready access to somebody that can help you troubleshoot when things go off the rails. Uh, applications and online content. And by that, we mean the ability to go on to an online portal and submit a job application or something like a, a piece of software that exists only online. And additionally, internet enabled devices. So again, that's your smartphone, but that's also a tablet, a laptop, a device that allows you to complete, to use and complete um, 
a the things that you need to do for every day, right? So there's certainly devices that will help connect you to the internet, but also other devices that are more readily um, that make more sense for the kinds of um, uh, opportunities that you want to to do online. We heard a lot during the pandemic, right, where maybe you had a a tablet but you weren't able to download and edit PDFs because you didn't have the right software. So it's making sure that you have the device necessary to complete the task at hand. I'm not telling you anything you don't know here with this slide, but you already provide so many digital opportunity resources. And um, I know that libraries were not um, we're not new to this, especially after um, as you uh, kind of began to reinvent or um, sort of pivot during the pandemic. So you already provided free Wi-Fi access, you already provided digital literacy. Um, and I would also say that a lot of folks, um, especially in my previous role at TSLAC, you know, we would talk often about how could, um, maybe you weren't thinking about digital literacy, you weren't doing digital literacy every day, but you know, you were doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one assistance, whether creating a resume, um, you maybe if you want to think about digital literacy training in a lot of different environments. So it could be one-on-one, -on -one, it could be over the phone, it could be helping troubleshoot someone with their Wi-Fi printer. You all do so many different things to help expand people's capacity. And you also help uh, provide people access to either those public computer labs, whether it's lending out tablets, laptops, um, Again, providing that free Wi-Fi printing, lots of ways that you have leveraged using devices to expand people's um, uh, access to that, um, something that they wouldn't normally have otherwise. We also, I know through the emergency connectivity funds, many libraries were able to actually distribute devices for long-term lending and use. So I wanna talk just a little bit too about um, the Broadband Development Office. So, um, we have, so the Broadband Development Office is actually housed within the Comptroller of Public Accounts, and that's in Austin, so I'm still based in Austin, and we had three requirements that when the legislature created this office, where we just celebrated our second birthday, um, was to create a state broadband plan, it was to create a map of availability, and it was also to implement a broadband development program to expand broadband. So those are those sort of the three areas that might have like kind of a finite timeline. The other things that um, we're being asked to do is also to serve as a, an information clearinghouse. So if people have questions about broadband and digital access, we hope to also um, help provide, point out to our particular partners that are working in these areas to ensure that, that folks that have questions around broadband and digital opportunity have ac ease ready access to what is happening across the state. We, um, again, as I sort of mentioned earlier, we're also, um, let's see what the next slide is. Okay, so the other thing that's kind of interesting about the broadband office too, is that we were created right before a lot, a lot of federal funding was set aside for states to expand broadband and digital opportunity programming. And so, the broadband office is also now kind of considered what uh, an administering entity. So we are going to be the folks that continue to um, administer those broadband expansion plans and related programs. So that might be um, state funds, it might be federal funds, it might be other dollars that come down the line. Okay, so um, this was sort of the First, so I want to talk a little bit about the landscape of broadband funding in Texas. Um, and it's important because as library folks will likely be asked by, because broadband is sort of on, on the mind, you will likely be hearing about broadband outside of maybe the normal context that you might have in the past. So by that, I mean that there's a lot of funding that is now available for municipalities and local governments to expand broadband. And many times um, they're also, the, the, those activities are being done on behalf of uh, those municipalities are working with 
or at least being um, engaged by local internet service providers. So those local internet service providers, they realize that this is a, an opportune time to help expand their footprint into communities that historically might have not been um, as, um, or might have not returned a good return on investment for those communities. And so with this federal broadband, with these federal broadband grants, these internet service providers are now being engaged to provide funding in communities and areas where they didn't normally. What's great about the fact that this is happening now is that because there has been so much attention on digital opportunity and inclusion and ensuring that communities that have historically been left behind are engaged is that ISPs are being asked to be much more intentional when they're submitting grant plans. So they might think about, they might be asked, hey, talk a little bit about your digital opportunity plan. And for an ISP, they might, this might be a very new concept to them. So they might be looking for guidance from local communities on what digital opportunity could look like. So this is a really perfect time for libraries to position themselves as experts in digital opportunity. So I, I just, I'm planting that seed now and we'll continue to work through it. But I want you to think a little bit about the, um, your, your, your real sense of agency and authority in this field now because this idea that you all have been working in for a while is now you have, you, have, you have the subject matter expertise and you can position yourselves to be a subject matter expert for people that see that really need your help. So we received, so the broadband office received about um, a half a million dollars in coronavirus capital projects funds or ARPA funds. Um, the state library also dispensed some, did created some programs around using ARPA funds. And the idea here was to use, to help in, um, to help ensure that all communities have access to high quality modern infrastructure, including broadband. And one of those areas of need was certainly to ensure that folks had access to healthcare, workforce, and education. So, um, this, the broadband office was able to fund at this point three projects, one of which was, I'm so excited to say, is uh, a project by the Texas State Library and Archives Commission to improve infrastructure. And I think I saw Henry on this call, so I think he'll be probably, you'll be hearing more about that soon, but this is particularly to help the libraries and areas, and this is particularly to be to assist um, communities that are are not receiving those um, those high speeds. So when we talked about high speed broadband, the twenty five over three and the hundred over twenty, these funds are going directly to improve areas that do not have current access to that. So the broadband office is going to be able to pass off funds to these other state agencies that have great subject matter expertise in their areas, right? So the state library, you'll be hearing more from them about how to improve um, access in libraries in these communities, but two other uh, state agencies as well, the Department of Transportation and the Department of Agriculture. And again, I'm calling these out because I want you to know that other state agencies that have different reaches within your community might be engaging either you or other um, leaders, um, decision makers, stakeholders to better understand how to assist implementing these grant programs and these grant funds. So libraries, you know, you have no been learning about telehealth, you've been learning about digital inclusion, digital access, you've been learning, you do this stuff every day. Um, I just want you to be aware that there are other state agencies that might be engaging you or your leadership. So know that that's, that's coming and that wouldn't it be great if you were the first person telling your, <laughs> your person, your, your, you know, your county judge or your, um, decision maker that you you know digital opportunity you want to be available to consult on that. The other pot of funding that you'll likely be hearing a lot about, um, if you haven't already, is this um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding. 
it um, was passed in 2021. Um, uh, the uh, IIJA was passed in 2021 and allocated a lot of money to the National Telecommunications and Information Administration for two particular programs. One is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment or BEAD program. And that's to help close the physical infrastructure divide in Texas. And the other is funding that's coming from the Digital Equity Act. And that's to really close that earlier slide I talked about digital opportunity. So there's gonna be two buckets of funding that communities in Texas are going to have access to in order to improve both infrastructure and sort of that digital opportunity area. So all of those different pieces related to skill, device access, affordability. Most of these programs, as you know, and I'll get to this in just a second, but these two programs are in development right now by the broadband office. So we're, we don't have a lot of, actually you're gonna be able to see it soon. We are developing what these programs will look like so that communities can be, um, can then apply for these funds probably in late, like mid next year, mid 2024. Texas got the largest allocation of infrastructure funding. We, that means we have a, the largest number of people that are unserved in our communities, which means they are getting less than that 25 up, three down access. And we don't quite yet know how much money we'll have to be able to distribute around the Digital Equity Act. Hopefully soon. So here's the timeline. And I wanna, I know that this is a lot of information. So hopefully this will sort of distill what is coming. Um, right now we're in a lot of prep work phase. So we received our planning friends last year. Um, then we did a lot of public engagement around um, what community needs are and where these, these um, affordability gaps, um, infrastructure gaps are. Then we had to submit a few different documents or planning documents to the NTIA for them to understand that we're using these funds well. And then um, we're going to open up for public comment. That means for your feedback, these documents so that we can make sure that they're reflecting um, what what, it, what the lived experience actually looks like, what it's actually happening on the ground. We're doing our best to get it right, but we wanna be corrected if, you know, if we're off the mark at all. After we submit those for your public comment, we'll take them back, add your comments, and send them back off for approval. Once we get that approval, we're gonna be able to start actually implementing the and dispensing these grant programs for your application for, for you to be able to apply. Um, Let's see what the next slide is. Okay, so here's the, the upside and the downside of where we are right now. The upside is that we do have something called a notice of funding opportunity open for the infrastructure side. So we know the program details from the federal government about how to actually design the program and develop the program. We don't have yet the notice of funding opportunity for their digital opportunity plan or digital equity act planning. Um, we're waiting to hear more on that, which means that we're sort of in a hold, holding pattern until we get more guidance on what that might look like. So um, that's why I really wanted to make sure that you all understand what other entities across the state, what other organizations across the state that did get that, that do have that opportunity to begin those public those engagements with organizations, why you might be hearing from them now, because they were able to get started a little bit sooner on some of the other funds. So I didn't want you to wait until this digital opportunity planning is available to begin those conversations and building those relationships. Um, you know, let me see, it's 3.30. I'm just going to stop here just for a second before I go on. Are there any questions about this? Because I feel like I've been talking for a while and I don't want to drone on. And Dorothy, it's so nice to see your face. So thank you so much for having your camera on today. I can see a familiar face. <laughs> Are there any questions about this that I can answer or just other thoughts you might have? I don't think there are any questions in the chat, but you guys feel free to unmute and ask Cindy. This is a lot of information, but we want you to be the first ones here getting it. <laughs> 
So Cindy in the chat, just curious why the Rural Hospital Grant is under the Department of Agriculture and not the Department of Health. Oh, good question. I don't actually know the answer to that question, Michelle. But um, I think that uh, actually, Andrea, D so my colleague, Andrea Pacheco is also on the line. She's our fabulous outreach coordinator. Andrea, do you do you know, by any chance? I, I do not know that particular uh, reason why it, how it ended up. But those those programs and uh, proposals were drawn up before either Cindy or I were with the office. Sorry. <laughs> I think it's because um, I'm actually Googling for that right now. Oh, you guys, um, I'm Googling for that right now. So I think that they, I think it's because they have, oh, because the state office of rural health is actually underneath the Texas Department of Ag. There you way go. To, way to use your resources, Cindy. <laughs> librarian, you know, I don't have to work in a library to library. The librarian. Great question. And now I know. I know, right? Well, and I think that, Michelle, I'm glad that you asked that question. We kind of did this on the fly here because I think that also really showcases how interconnected so many different organizations and how many unlikely stakeholders um, and potential partners exist outside of maybe our more traditional um, our more traditional partnerships, like the people that we might consider to be um, doing this work, they're everywhere, right? Um, or, and I should also mention as we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, the, uh, the public engagement that we've been doing for the digital opportunity plan is one of those things is to collect an asset map. That's a requirement to include in our plan. The asset map, is it will will begin to build this sort of uh, statewide um, database of people doing digital opportunity work so that we'll be able to see by county, maybe by city, um, you know, by covered population, we'll be able to start seeing, be able to start finding partnerships in doing this work a little bit more readily because right now it's pretty disorganized, a little chaotic. Um, but I, the way I kind of get through the, the day sometimes is just to, to remind myself this is the first time a lot of us are doing something at such a scale. And so we're creating a roadmap. So writing that roadmap is really challenging. Um, yeah, and uh, Dorothy wrote, especially in the rural areas, yeah, there's a lot of non-traditional partners, certainly in rural areas that, you know, you find because you have to maybe wear a lot of hats in the in rural areas, right? There's not as many services happening there. Okay. Um, all right. So, do, 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 do. hold on, where are Okay, Denise. Denise says, I know there's a lot of focus on rural underserved communities as there should be, but it's also a good reminder that all cities, towns benefit are encouraged to the and encouraged to secure broadband funding underserved are all around us. Yes, I really appreciate you saying that, Denise, because that is absolutely true. It can be really easy to get lost in sort of like the larger broad generalization when we look at maps, right? Like when we see that there are different shades and areas, we might say, oh, well, we really need to focus on this one area because they have a higher percentage of X. But to your point, every community is going to have folks that are underserved. And that's why having a framework and building partnerships um, with local communities and showing the local stakeholders and trying to engage as much as possible in those conversations at a, at a micro level, at a hyper local level, helps reveal that there is need in every community. So um, as we are designing grant programs, you know, some of our requirements from the, from the federal government are to show, to kind of enact what are called key performance indicators or KPIs so that we can measure impact over time. But it can be really hard to, from a broad level, create something that seems, that shows impact um, 
because we want to show that we're creating an impact, but some of those impacts, especially in when there's underserved and smaller percentages, how do you design a key performance indicator where maybe the population is very small and in a way niche? So there's like a lot of like, yeah, everyone deserves funding to do this work and designing something to make sure that it is for all is definitely a big challenge ahead of us. And I think the more that we can um, be reminded of how to do that work and be reminded that, you know, that there is need in every community, we can continue to focus on, yeah, everyone needs funding. Let's figure out how we do this. Keep, keep reminding us, you know, Denise, don't, don't, let, don't let me off the hook. Don't let us off the hook there. All right. Um, okay. So this slide describes a little bit about our public are you guys, still, you guys are still able to see my, yes, okay. So I'm gonna move into a little bit more detail around uh, the Broadband Development Office's public engagement process for developing our plans for the federal government or NTIA for approval. So um, we hosted a series of um, public meetings that Andrea was such a champion. I think you went to like like 14 of the 24 or 18 of the 24, Andrea. You're on mute. Amateur hour for getting mute. Yeah, I think it was 16 was my okay. total. All right. So the team crisscrossed uh, the state. Andrea was a champion. Um, and um, we went out to all of the, to different 20 to 24 different uh, parts of the state and um, heard from communities where about their needs as it pertains to um, the, for, for particularly for digital opportunity. In addition to doing those in-person events, sort of as a precursor was to have a survey. Um, it was an individual survey um, that uh, mapped both, um, had folks, um, to uh, respond to a number of questions about internet access, affordability, device access. There was a speed test incorporated. We received um, almost 10,000 valid online responses and uh, 1,500 paper responses because there was that option there. Um, and you'll see on the, um, the map on the left, the different levels of the, sh the darker the shade of orange, the more surveys that we were received completed we also additionally did an organizational survey where we asked organizations that engage in digital opportunity work, just tell us what you're doing, tell us where you're located, maybe tell us who your partners are. I have a feeling that I know that, that TLA did a wonderful job sort of promoting this. I know that TSLAC did a wonderful job promoting this. Thank you both so much for this. And you will see that your work um, was, inc was, was readily um, apparent. Um, so, okay, so let me tell you a little bit more. So the people that responded to our public survey were, um, and, and folks could select more than one, um, more than one op option, obviously. So we had uh, folks over 60, folks from ethnic minorities, folks in rural areas, folks that are living at or below 150% of the poverty level, folks with language barriers, and it goes on. So you kind of see it's sort of the, the shade we were able to really hear from a good intersection of folks. And then we were able to provide the survey in multiple languages, uh, the majority of which were completed in English, but we did have some folks that did take it in some of the Spanish, simplified Chinese and Vietnamese as well. Okay, next up we have um, some of the responses to our organizational survey. We called it the, <laughs> The DRMTS, because even the broadband office, we love our acronyms. Uh, it stands for the Digital Resources Mapping Tool Survey. Um, so again, percentage of responses by community anchor. Hey, look at that. The job libraries, 20% of the responses were coming from, um, from libraries. And then we had 19% from community support or other community-based organizations, schools, community colleges, et cetera. So well, thanks, the TLA is like good job, everybody. Um, then we had about 30% of folks responding from city government, 20% responding from county government, and then it goes on from there. And then finally, we had almost three quarters of our responses coming from, for the private sector, from nonprofit organizations. 
So the um, the importance again of the digital resources mapping tool, as I mentioned earlier, was just that we would have a broad cross section of folks that are doing and engaged in this work. And so it's really great to see the kinds of partnerships that we could potentially have. These are the folks that quite frankly, right, we should all be working together to close the digital divide. And it's great to see so many different types of organizations that are um, engaged already, but also yay for libraries at 20%. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we went, we traipsed across the state and visited 24 cities and hosted two virtual meetings. Um, each of the, so the broadband office, as I mentioned earlier, is, is located within the comptroller of Texas uh, public accounts. And so the comptroller has um, economic regions. So there are 12 economic regions of the state. We visited each economic region twice. So you'll kind of see that's how these are all mapped out. There were um, over 1,200 participants across the meetings, and they represented 127 counties. At the public meetings, because you can collect all the data you want, right, with, from a public survey, but having the opportunity to meet people in person and hear some really um, a really impactful stories from community members and organizations was um, essential to really getting a holistic picture of, of what the need is. So um, government agencies and residents were the two highest, uh, uh, government agencies, residents and nonprofits were some of the three highest participants in our public meetings followed by internet service providers and for-profits. And um, it was really interesting. I, I think a few of you may have attended some of these public meetings. Um, but some of my favorite experiences from these public engagement meetings were having residents sit at the same table as an internet service provider and having the internet service provider really explain what and why there wasn't service in their street and some, or there wasn't service on their block and really listening and having all participants listening really cordially and quite frankly you know there's a lot of learning happening on both sides because this is a very complex issue it may seem easy but at the end of the day there are nuances from from multiple perspectives so having the opportunity to really have folks listen to one another um, and information share was was really exciting and enlightening um, Feel free to either unmute or maybe type in the chat. Did anyone att attend any of the public meetings in your area? Dorothy, I see a rigorous head nod. Anyone yes, else? Yes, I did. I went to the one in San Antonio and it was eye opening, especially to hear somebody on the ISP side talk about the lack of labor. They didn't have the labor resources. And we always just assume that the ISPs have the labor needed to do to do the work. And there was somebody that was actually, that was, that's what she did. And it was a woman, I might add. And that's what she did. And she said that there, there isn't enough people that are qualified to do the labor. Yeah, and I, thanks for, for highlighting that. I mean, there, my coworker likes to say that this, uh, the the job, the bead and the Digital Equity Act are trying to solve all of the country's internet problems all at once within five years, and it's funny, but it's not funny. But it's also funny because they're up and down across the board. There are just obstacles to try to overcome, and one of those is exactly what you're saying, Dorothy. Just the people, the people necessary, the train, the training programs that need to be in place you know, having access to folks that are, you know, having programs prepared and ready to go for ISPs to be able to train new people in and skill them on the job. And I mean, it's just such a massive lift across the line. So um, it is a, um, yeah, it's good to, I think, right. It is good to hear why the, that every industry or every organization is maybe struggling with their ability to, to deliver. Um, and how we can hear each other and hopefully resolve. Okay. Do, 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 do. Okay, some other public meeting summary information. Um, populations who are either attended or who they serve um, for reside in rural areas was uh, probably around 19 percent. 19%. 
uh, folks that are over the age of 60, low-income folks, folks that are, are identified as a racial or ethnic minority, the veterans, sort of on down the line. So again, these were some of the people that we saw at our meetings. And here are some of our key takeaways from what we learned at the public meetings. Um, two, two major areas, uh, availability and affordability. So just the cost of internet service is just incredibly challenging, um, which is why some of those government subsidy programs are so important to be able to help people pay for their internet. Um, top priorities, improve that high-speed infrastructure, please build, right? But also um, if you build it, please make sure that it is fast and reliable. Um, again, some things that we've heard, not only from um, that, that the, while we hear a lot from uh, reliability in rural areas, that really happens across the board, right? It's just make sure that we have access to speed and reliability. Widely available assets, so things that um, most communities have, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity and public access to computers. Thank you again, libraries, for providing um, access. Um, there are workforce solution center that often will provide access to computers, but I think far and away we've heard libraries being able to provide that resource. And then some of the least common resources um, computer coding education, subscribing to internet service. So who helps people decide what, um, how they can either best get a, um, a subscription plan that meets their needs. Um, and then also how to have access to someone that can continue to meet their digital opportunity needs or digital literacy needs over time. That's that community technical support. So those are some of the things that were released frequently um, said to be available to folks. And I'll end on this sort of um, what I kind of started with, which was where do you fall in here? What, how can we, how can we work together? Um, how can we partner? How do we, how do we work together to close the digital divide? What can we do? So just keep doing so much of what you're already doing is stay engaged, make sure that, um, that you are attending meetings, that you're signed up for our newsletter, which will be in a link on the next slide. But also, I just really want to double down on the fact that as subject matter experts on digital literacy and digital opportunity, make sure that your voice is being heard where you can. Um, we all have been doing this for such a long time. It's important that you um, that you are engaged and as so many of the library staff that I've met do already, that you you know who's ear to bend. Um, and um, if, if they don't make sure that you're the person that's telling them that this funding is coming and telling them why this funding is important for their community because I know you all know. Um, and then finally, um, we will have those plans available for your feedback and comment uh, during the month of November um, and through the early winter. So um, I'll make sure to send it out to um, to Kelly and to the folks at TLA. I know my, my colleagues at uh, TSLAC will also uh, be sharing that information out and make sure that you share that out with any of your local county um, officials, any other stakeholders, your community organizations that you partner with for your programming. We we do would, would really love to make sure that this reflects again, the needs of all, all Texans. And then finally, we have a local government round table each Thursday of the month at 10 a.m. Um, this is, it says local government, but it's really for anybody. So you don't have to be the official person from a local government to attend. Um, we have, Andrew, did you wanna to speak to this? Yeah, the, this uh, meeting is making me want to rename what we call it. <laughs> because, right? Like, yeah, because like like Cindy said, it's not exclusively for local governments. It would definitely be very appropriate for anyone on this call to attend um, a roundtable or multiple roundtables. We, we hold them monthly, so it's a good place to stay up to date on what we're doing in the office. Yeah, and I think it's also um, I think it's also a really great opportunity you know, it, it has pushed Andrea and I also to think about how to highlight the great work that is happening in other areas of Texas. And so um, sometimes it's, you know, someone will ask a question that helps highlight an area of need that 
the broadband office needs to investigate further or that another person in another organization across the state can assist with. So it's been really nice for a way for it to do some information sharing. We have our monthly newsletters, and then we also have our outreach page on the broadband office's website. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Yep, that's it. That's the last slide. So i um, happy to take any additional questions or Andrea, if there's anything that, that you wanted to kind of highlight that I may have missed or just didn't think about, <laughs> go free. No, Cindy, one thing you are is thorough. I think that that was, that was excellent. <laughs> I can't think of anything that you missed. Um, but I did want to say a little advertisement. I will be at the uh, the TLA talks or presentation in Lubbock on Saturday. So um, I will be, give, be giving a very abbreviated version of this, but then uh, also participating on a panel. So if anybody's in the Lubbock area, love to see you there. Thanks, Andrea. And I think actually we might have some folks from TSLAC that might also be on a TAL talks panel. Is that right? Oh. I don't know. Okay. Well, we're moderating it. So. Oh, we'll you're moderating it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We have a few others that will be um, other attendees here today that will be on panels throughout. I think Miss Anna is going to be with us at Clue. And so um, familiar faces, guys, if this has triggered any thoughts or ideas, um, please come visit us. And Cindy, this has been wonderful. Any questions at all for Cindy and for Andrea even? Well, if you guys have any questions at all, um, we will have this recording posted and we will also have um, Cindy's information and the Broadband, Broadband Development Office information. Uh, Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Cindy. This was thorough. This was perfect. This is exactly what we needed. And we can't wait to collaborate with you soon. Everyone else, thank you for being with us today. And we will see you very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you around. Bye, guys. Bye.